to please stand and turn to Psalm number six, as we will first pray and then read the word of God. Psalm number six. Let us pray. And now we humble ourselves before God Almighty, whose grace has gifted us and whose love has saved us. Patiently now we wait for thee. You word as a lamp to our paths and a light to our feet. May the Holy Spirit strengthen his servant to deliver a word of truth so that many to Jesus will come and meet. Amen. Psalm number 6, verses 1 to 10. The NASB says, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chastise me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am pining away. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are dismayed, and my soul is greatly dismayed. But you, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, rescue my soul. Save me because of your loving kindness, for there is, men for there is no mention of you in death, in Sheol, who will give you thanks? I am weary with my sighing. Every night I make my bed swim. I dissolve my couch with my tears. My eye has wasted away with grief. It has become old because of all my adversaries. Depart from me, all you who do iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord receives my prayer. All my enemies will be ashamed and greatly dismayed. They shall turn back and will suddenly be ashamed. Please be seated. So as we continue the series, preaching through the Psalms, we are now in Psalm number 6. And we've noticed a theme through the five prior Psalms. Each has portrayed a contrast. Psalm number 1, we have the blessed person and the wicked person. Psalm number 2, you have the kings and nations revolting against God's anointed, and God's anointed king. Psalm number five, you have the righteous man and the workers of iniquity. And now in Psalm number six, we have King David who is troubled, who is in conflict with the trouble makers. We find King David who is bruised, King David who is broken, King David who is in a rut, and as a result in Psalm number 6, he writes from his heart, and Psalm number 6 therefore teaches us how to keep our hearts in times of trouble. Psalm number 6 gives us a voice when we lose the will to pray. Psalm number 6 gives you words when you don't know what to say. Psalm number six gives you hope by showing you where to go and what to do when you experience a felt separation from God. In Psalm number six, King David goes through a bout of spiritual depression. That is a term coined by the late Martin Lloyd-Jones. In Psalm number six, King David goes through spiritual depression. What does that mean? Spiritual depression means depression that has a spiritual cause. Now I'm going to speak now as a medical doctor. When we diagnose 
clinical depression, we're not actually giving you a reason why you're depressed. We're merely describing a constellation of symptoms that classifies someone as depressed, but we're not giving you a cause. We're not giving you a reason as to why you're depressed. And in Psalm number six, the cause of David's depression is spiritual. Now let's make sure we're clear. What I'm not trying to suggest is that all cases of depression have a spiritual cause. Because medically speaking, there are real biological natural causes of depression. For example, if you've had a stroke and the wiring in your brain is now altered, you will have depression. If your thyroid is underactive and literally your entire body slows down, you are now going to have symptoms of depression. In those instances, you don't need fasting or prayer, you need thyroid supplementation. The point is that in some cases of depression, the cause isn't psychological, the cause isn't biological, it is spiritual. And King David goes through depression in this psalm, its root cause being a felt separation from God. Hence, spiritual depression. Spiritual depression isn't something which is fleeting. It's not something which you experience for two or three seconds and then it goes away. It's something that's pervasive. It's something that's persistent. It's something that alters your day-to-day -day activities, the way you think, the way you act, and the way you go about your everyday life. And in the next points I'm about to mention, all of these points are what clinicians now use to diagnose depression, and they're also symptoms that King David experienced in Psalm number six. Number one, a depressed mood or feeling sad, empty, or hopeless, as in, I feel isolated, I feel as if God is so far away, he's forgotten about me. Number two, a diminished interest or pleasure in all or almost all activities, as in, I feel so run down, I don't want to pray anymore. I don't want to go to church anymore. I don't want to expose myself to people who are of the Christian faith. Number three, sleep disturbance. Number four, a loss of energy. You lose your zeal, you lose your fire. All the things you used to get excited about, now you're apathetic about. Number five, feelings of worthlessness or excessive guilt, as in, I'm too broken, I'm too dirty, I'm too filthy for God. Number six, can't think straight or concentrate. And number seven, thoughts of death or suicide. As in, Lord, I've given up, there's no hope. Take my life now and take me home. Spiritual depression has a spiritual cause, meaning a pill can't fix it. Spiritual depression has a spiritual cause, so there's no natural, there's no biological, or any psychological treatment plan that will fix your soul, because prescription medication can't cure a soul problem, can't cure a spirit problem. And just in case Someone is thinking spiritual depression is something that those people experience. Just in case someone thinks spiritual depression is something that only a teeny tiny fraction of immature, of abnormal, of a small minority of people actually experience, consider who's going through spiritual depression in Psalm number six, King David 
who wasn't a poor example of a believer. He was a prototypical example of a believer in the Old Testament. In fact, King David was a type of Christ. I dare say that if you were to show me an example of a Christian who has never experienced spiritual depression, you have now shown me a poor example of a Christian. Because as we grow and God really uses us for his glory in this world, we are going to fight real, spiritual, heavy-hitting battles and suffer. Here's a fact. The devil never tackles anybody sitting on the bench. He tackles star players. Hence, spiritual depression can in fact be a sign of spiritual maturity. I'm going to validate that point even more. Who else suffered from spiritual depression? The Apostle Paul in Acts 2019. He expresses his heart anguish and his frustrations with life. He says, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears. 2 Corinthians 2.4 For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears. Philippians 3.18 For many walk of whom I often told you and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Jesus Christ was never described as a man who was happily skipping through life. Jesus Christ was described as a man of sorrows. And by definition, he was the one who suffered the ultimate spiritual depression on the cross when he had to be separated from his heavenly father to endure the penalty and endure the full wrath of God for all sin from eternity past to eternity future. And when he experienced spiritual depression, he verbalized it in Psalm 22 and said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So now that we know what King David experienced in Psalm number 6, what does he do? How does he navigate out from his rut? Verses 1 to 4. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am pining away. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are dismayed, and my soul is greatly dismayed. But you, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, rescue my soul. Point number one. The cure for spiritual depression. Point number one. Only the spiritual Lord can cure a spiritual disease. Only the spiritual Lord can cure a spiritual disease. Five times in the first four verses of Psalm number six, David doesn't call out to a generic God. He calls out to Lord, capital L-O-R-D, which he means David is using the covenantal name of God, Yahweh the personal revelation of God Almighty to his people. And when David five times in four verses calls upon God's personal name, he's not just calling out to God in general in a vague sense. He's calling out to God and calling upon the character of the God of the Bible. He's calling out to his Lord and his God, Yahweh. And the Yahweh of the Bible, his character involves eternity, his character involves infinity, his character involves immutability. His character means that the Yahweh of the Bible is always bigger than your problem. Yahweh is the king of kings 
and the Lord of Lords. So David is calling out to the Lord who sits on the highest throne in the entire universe. There's no other authority higher than Yahweh. And David says, Lord, do not rebuke me nor chasten me. This isn't a confession of sin. Because at no point in Psalm number 6 does David either confess sin or ask for forgiveness. David is basically entreating God, saying, Lord, I am so broken. Lord, I am so beaten down. Lord, I am wasting away to such a degree. If you treat me roughly or if you treat me harshly, I am going to fade away into the dust. So, Lord, do not rebuke me. Do not chasten me. Don't treat me like a foreigner. Don't treat me like an alien. Don't treat me like a stranger. Treat me as if I am your child. And when David says, be gracious to me, he's entreating Yahweh to give him unmerited, unearned favor. Because here's the good news about the Yahweh of the Bible. In the world, people like pretending. In the world, people like puffing themselves up. In the world, you need to achieve more. You need to do more. You need to act as if to get attention. You need to do X, Y, and Z in order to be validated as okay. But here's what the Yahweh of the Bible is. He was always in charge from eternity past to eternity future. So if you approach the Yahweh of the Bible and you puff yourself up, He's going to knock you down. But when you approach the Yahweh of the Bible and say, Lord, I'm broken. Lord, I'm helpless. Lord, I'm hopeless. Be gracious to me. The more broken you are, the more the Yahweh of the Bible will help you. Because when you come down real, real low with Yahweh, that just means he can now extend his gracious hand further and further down to pick you up. The Jews used to call Yahweh in the Bible, Yahweh Rapha, or Jehovah Rapha, which means the Lord heals. If you have a blind eye, Jehovah Rapha can heal you. If you have leprous skin, he can heal you. If you have a depraved mind, he can heal you. If you have an unregenerate spirit, he can heal you. The Yahweh who created you can recreate you, can redream you, can regenerate you and turn you into a new human being. So if you call upon the Yahweh of the Bible and ask him to be gracious to you, you're asking him to do what he specializes in. And David begins this prayer not denying what's going on. He says, Lord, my bones are dismayed. My soul is greatly dismayed. I'm wasting away. David never denies what's going on or what he's feeling because denial as a strategy never works. We live in a world, as I said, where everyone loves pretending. We live in a world where sometimes people have been in church for three and four decades and aren't saved. We live in a world where, especially in the church, people come day in and day out and have feelings of same-sex attraction, and we try to deny the fact that that's real. We try to deny the fact that mental illness is real. And mental illness really has real consequences in real life. But sticking your head in the sand is never going to solve anything. We must be honest, and if someone hearing my words is suffering from spiritual depression, you have to be transparent and upfront to someone. It doesn't have to be someone in your immediate family immediately. It doesn't have to be someone in your own church. If you feel more comfortable seeking the help of someone of faith outside of your immediate network, that is fine. But denial never works. You must be honest, transparent, and upfront. Point number two. The cure for spiritual depression, point number two. Spiritual depression is real, therefore, you must be real about your problem. 
God hates fake. God is a God of truth. God stands diametrically opposed to anything that's concealed in the darkness or anything that is not true. And David is being real about his real spiritual problem. In fact, David was the giant slayer, right? He was the guy who killed Goliath, right? What is David doing? The giant slayer is saying, God, I'm weak. God, I'm helpless. God, I'm broken. God, I'm wasting away. Whenever someone tells me things like, the Bible tries to make men look like supermen and women look like subordinates, they clearly haven't read Psalm number six. Because David is being so real, he's saying, I am broken down into the ground on the verge of death. He's being so real that actually redefines our modern conception of manliness. David gets so real. He says, I am pining away. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are dismayed. Pining away essentially means wasting away. And when he says, my bones are dismayed, that has a literal meaning and a figurative meaning. Why does he use the word bones? Because our bones are the sturdiest part of our frame. Fat tissue, tendons, muscles, they're all soft. But the bones now, they're the strongest, sturdiest part of our frames. Therefore, they're the most resistant to pressure. And David is saying, not only are my physical bones being sh shook into the core, but my inner being, the sturdy part of myself, the thing that which I thought was the most uh, strong and sturdy, even that is being rattled to the core. And what David makes crystal clear for us is that he has a real felt separation from God. He has a real spiritual problem, which is now manifesting as real mental problems and real biological physical problems. David says, and my soul is greatly dismayed. Return, O Lord. You only ask someone to return if they're gone. You only ask someone to return if they're not there. So when David says, return, O Lord, that's the crux of his problem. David senses, David feels as if God has abandoned him, and that is why his bones are dismayed and his soul is greatly dismayed. And again, bones and soul refers to his outer being as well as his inner being. And when you have a soul that is greatly dismayed, as Charles Haddon Spurgeon once said, soul trouble is the very soul of trouble. Now, beloved, we have to make sure we take a step back here for a second and realize whenever we talk about the wholeness or the wellness of an entire person, we have to realize that we have a spirit, we have a soul, and we have the body. And whenever we talk about overall wellness of an individual, we have to consider all three. When I use my hat as a Bible teacher, I realize that theology in general can over-spiritualize things, where they think all problems are spiritual, not realizing we have souls and bodies. When I put on my medical doctor hat, people in that realm tend to think that people are disembodied bodies, where we just have a natural physical body, but yet we still have a soul as well as a spirit as well. Either extreme on both ends isn't going to heal the whole person. In order to treat the totality of an individual, we have to realize that spirit influences soul, influences body, and vice versa. And what David is making crystal clear in the psalm is how, biblically speaking, all three interact because a felt separation from God, a spirit problem, is giving him soul trouble, which therefore results in bodily trouble. And you can't treat one aspect of our inner self 
without treating the other two, because in that sense, you're only going to be treating one third of the person. You must consider the totality of the individual. And then David asks the question, how long? How long, O Lord, must I endure this separation? How long, O Lord, until this trial ends? How long, O Lord, before I actually get a good night's sleep? How long, O Lord, before, the, before all the adversaries that are lining up against me? when they will be silenced and I can walk amongst them in peace. This isn't a question of bitterness or impatience. It's a question of eager anticipation. In fact, the question how long is asked 16 times in the Psalms. It's never sinful in the height of our trial, in the height of our felt separation from God, to ask the question, how long? What can be sinful is what you do after you ask the question, how long? Because time and time again, we may ask the Lord, how long, O Lord? And God's answer is always the same, until my purposes are complete. And that is a truth that is far harder to live than it is to preach. We can ask how long, as long as we ask and then wait on the Lord. When we wait on God, we can either despise it, resist it, collapse under it and quit, or accept it and submit to it. Because as Warren Worsby once said, quote, Pain either makes us better or bitter, and the difference is faith. David then says, Return, O Lord, rescue my soul. Save me because of your loving kindness. Save me because of your loving kindness. Point number three. The cure for spiritual depression, point number three. Recognize that God's grace is bigger than your problem. Recognize that God's grace is bigger than spiritual depression. Just as David realized that God's absence was the cause of his problem, David therefore prays for God to return so that God's presence would be the solution to the problem. And here's what's interesting. At the end of the psalm in verse number 7, David is going up against adversaries. David doesn't pray for God to remove his adversaries. He only prays for God to return. Because guess what? You could get a solution to your adversaries. You could get a solution to your present circumstance, but you could get that solution and not have God. So David now entreats the Lord to return, knowing that when God is present and his grace is there, that will solve all problems because the grace of God is bigger than your problem. A natural solution may just be equal to your problem. A natural solution may be less than your problem. And natural solutions are finite. They're contained. They wear off after a while. But God's presence and his grace is always bigger and eternal. And David appeals to the loving kindness. The most important word in Hebrew, he appeals to the hesed of God, the loyal love, the unmerited favor, and he appeals to God's hesed as the reason to save him. This goes back to point number one. Hesed, or steadfast love, or unmerited favor, is characteristic. It what almost defines Yahweh. It's what almost defines the God of the Bible. So when you now pray to Yahweh and ask him to treat you with hesed, do you know what you're really doing? You're asking God to act like God. 
You're asking Yahweh to act like Yahweh. And when the Yahweh of the Bible treats you with hesed, and you are now a recipient of unearned favor, which solves your problem, now you glorify God, thanking him for his hesed. And you don't even, you don't stop there. You now glorify God and then tell someone else about it. God's grace is bigger than your problem. Other faiths may say things like, God is great, or God is powerful. Well, what does that mean? You could be a great tyrant. You could be a great psychopath. But the Yahweh of the Bible isn't just great. The Yahweh is full of hesed, of loyal love, of steadfast loving kindness and mercy. So David's appeal for God to save him isn't David-centered, it's God-centered. Point number four. The cure for spiritual depression, point number four. By his grace, a good God uses spiritual depression with good intent, with good purpose for your eternal good. By his grace, a good God uses spiritual depression with good intent, with good purpose for your eternal good. Meaning, spiritual depression always has a meaning beyond itself. Here's a philosophical question. The Bible says God is omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere all the time. David says in Psalm number 6, return, O Lord, because he feels as if God is gone. So here's the question. If God is everywhere, then how can he go somewhere? If God is everywhere, then how can he go somewhere? Here's the answer. God can't go anywhere because he's everywhere all the time. The point is this. In the height of spiritual depression, you may feel as if, God isn't there. It may seem as if God isn't there, but he's always there. He's always watching. He's always supervising, but he will temporarily may give you the impression that he has withdrawn because the episode of spiritual depression, there's a reason for it. There's a purpose beyond itself. So why would God allow you to endure spiritual depression? There are a few general reasons. Number one, to prepare you by allowing you to be exposed to temptation so God can prepare you and nudge your spiritual growth to reveal to you. As Pastor Keith Battle always says, tests don't teach, they reveal. And in, in exposing you to spiritual depression, God wants you to see something about yourself that, time, that good times will not allow you to have any light on. The third reason is this. God could simply be using the depression to chasten you as a punishment for sin so you will become more humble. And that in and of itself, God's chastening is an act of grace. Do you know why? Because the Yahweh of the Bible never lets one of his children go to hell in peace, in one piece. In P-E-A-C-E, in one P-I-E-C-E. God loves you too much to allow that to happen. And if he sees you walking a crooked way, he will stop you in your tracks, make you feel some pain, turn you around, and put you back on the straight path. And then, of course, God will allow an episode of spiritual depression to sanctify you, to make you grow, to make you more mature. As Paul says in Romans 5, 3 to 4, we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. Point number five, the cure for spiritual depression, point number five, realize that spiritual depression is not a sin. Realize that spiritual depression is not a sin. David says in verses six to seven, 
Every night I make my bed swim, I dissolve my couch with my tears. My eye has wasted away with grief, it has become old because of my adversaries. David here expresses his helplessness and his hopelessness, but he doesn't feel isolated, he doesn't feel as if he can't approach God and have an audience with him, because spiritual depression is not a sin, therefore you never ought to feel as if you are isolated or inhibited from approaching God. This is why this point's important. Because the devil loves it when Christians go through bouts of depression. He loves it when believers go through bouts feeling as if they're in a state of spiritual depression and therefore sinful when in actuality they're not. And this is the reason why. Although spiritual depression, going through the experience, is not a sin, it can lead to it. It can be the impetus for it. So if the devil can delude you into thinking that all of your feelings are the result of sin, he can take away your hope, he can rob you of your joy, he can nudge and fuel the fire of that emptiness you feel on the inside and now nudge you to start go searching for a way to fill that eternal hole in your heart. As I said before, human beings, they're, they're, it, they're three in one. It's spirit, soul, and body. When we consider how that interacts in everyday life, if you now show me a man who's a drunk, if you now show me someone who's addicted to drugs, if you now show me someone who's in a habitual cycle of behavior, we ought not to think now that the alcohol or the drugs are the problem. We ought to begin thinking, what hole are they trying to fill? What spirit problem do they have? What soul problem do they have? What deficiency have they been deluded into thinking exists? And their hopelessness and sadness now compels them to fill that gaping hole in their heart with the natural addictive substance. Because spiritual depression is not a sin, you ought never to waste your time thinking that you have to get your act together before you approach God. David comes to God in prayer saying, I'm wasted away, I'm broken, I'm helpless. David's not hysterical, he's not detached from his mind, but he realizes feeling this felt separation from God isn't sinful. Therefore, the door to approach God is open. You don't have to get your act together before you come to church. You don't have to get your act together before you approach someone in spiritual leadership because spiritual depression isn't a sin. And because it's not a sin, Christians ought to never delude themselves into thinking they ought not to feel sad. They ought not to feel this way. If the Bible does anything else, it gives human beings a reality check. And you know what the Bible is full of? Human beings feeling sad. Human beings feeling down. It so appreciates and embraces the sadness that's a part. The loss of hope and expectation that's a part of living everyday life. It gives us words to use when we feel that way, as in Psalm number 6. So realize that spiritual depression is not a sin. Now at the end of verse number 7. This is where David hits rock bottom. This is where the person who is alone needs companionship. This is where the person who is anguished needs relief. This is where the person who is sick needs to be made well and where the person who is sleepless needs rest. And what amplifies all of these feelings is the felt sensation that God isn't there. And this is the darkest part of the dark night of the soul where David asks over and over again, how long, Lord, 
and doesn't get an answer. Then what happens? Verse number eight. Depart from me, all you who do iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord receives my prayer. All my enemies will be ashamed and greatly dismayed. They shall turn back. They will suddenly be ashamed. That doesn't sound like a depressed person. That doesn't sound like a sad person. That sounds like someone who has hope, who has boldness, and who has confidence. What just happened in between the period at the end of verse number seven and the start of verse number eight? And the answer to that question is simple. What changed what turned everything around, what brought David from a low point to a place where he rested on a rock-solid foundation, he tells us three times in verses 8 to 10, God heard him. Three times in verses 8 to 10, David reiterates a, a, a something similar to, the Lord has heard me. In the height of your spiritual depression, your enemies don't care what you have to say. Your problems could care less whatever it is you call out to God about. But in the height of your spiritual depression, when you cry out to your heavenly Father, God will hear you. And when God hears, he acts. And when he acts, he comforts. That gives you comfort in spirit, that gives you comfort in soul, and it gives you comfort in body. And when he acts, he also gives you the assurance that he has heard you. And when you now have the resilient assurance that God has heard, you ha now have a resilient sense of boldness and confidence, and that restoration comes quickly. This is not a point I can simply preach and you write down in your Bible. This is a point that must be experienced, that must be lived. We're in the height of the dark night of the soul. When you ask how long, over and over and over again, and there are days when you get up and every molecule in your body revolts and doesn't want to pray and is losing steam and that fire is now gone, but you keep on keeping on and then instantaneously, miraculously, you call out to God and in an instant in prayer like that you go from feeling lowly and oppressed to having the bold resilience that God has heard and if the God Yahweh of the universe hears you what is there to be afraid of and what is it about God hearing and implanting within David's heart the assurance that he was heard that gives David the boldness and resilience to move forward? And the answer is very simple. The Holy Spirit implanted within David's heart a sense of hope. The cure for spiritual depression, point number six. Only the presence of the Holy Spirit can gift you with resilient hope. And spiritual hope is the ultimate cure for spiritual depression. Beloved, the root cause, what causes depression in general, is a lack of hope. When you are hopeless, and have no positive expectations for the future, that's when you feel worthless. That's when you feel apathetic. That is when you feel as if there's no point in continuing on because you are unable to see what the point of anything is. And if you look at the world around you, there are thousands upon thousands of reasons every day to not have hope because the world around us is depressing. It brings us down. There are so many things that are unreliable and don't meet our expectations. But when the Spirit gives you hope, 
you now have a source of confidence that transcends your situation. You now have a source of confidence that's bigger than what's going on right now. And when the Holy Spirit gives you spirit-infused hope, now you have identity, you have meaning, you have purpose, you have clarity, because the source of your hope isn't temporal, it's not natural, it's eternal. It's spiritual, and with a revived spirit, you now have a revived soul and a revived body. God is a God of hope, the only author of true hope. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Romans 15:13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Why God would allow this spiritual depressive episode to happen is also clarified here in the Holy Spirit gifting us hope. Because hope that is refined by the fires of spiritual depression is resistant to the harsh realities of life. And with this refined, spiritually infused sense of hope, which now is immune to all the things around us which try to depress us, you can now go through bigger trials, bigger temptations, and jump over bigger hurdles, having this bold, resilient, spirit-defined, 100% pure sense of God-given hope. And when there is hope and confidence in God, nothing can trigger depression ever again. David began the psalm in the first seven verses with a depressed mood. Now, in the end, he asks, what is there to be sad about? Because the Lord has heard me. Before, he had a diminished interest in life. Now, his enemies are confidently dismissed. Now, he's not listening to the voices of others. He's speaking God's truth to his adversaries. Before he was restless, now he has peace. Before he had a loss of energy, now he realizes there's work to be done. Before he had feelings of worthlessness, now he realizes he is a child of God that is so, he, that is so valued that God heard him. Before he had thoughts of death, now he realizes that David being wiped out means there would be silence in the grave and there would be, there'd be a, a silence on earth with a lack of one person to glorify God. So David says, I now won't waste my time thinking about death because I have to praise God. I have to glorify him. The cure for spiritual depression, point number seven. Past answers are the source of present confidence. Because God has done, he therefore will do. Point number seven. Past answers are the source of present confidence. Because God has done, therefore he will do. What does verse 10 say? Future tense. All my enemies will be ashamed and greatly dismayed. They shall turn back. They will suddenly be ashamed. This is future tense, which tells us what? At the end of Psalm number six, the adversaries that were there in verse number seven, guess what? They're still there. Guess what? They're still causing problems. But what's changed now is David now has refined spiritual hope. So even though the circumstances around him are still present, he now has a refined sense of boldness and confidence where they no longer cause a problem. He didn't have a change in situation. But now David, based on faith, could look back that God has heard me, could look back on what God has done, which gives him present confidence and therefore hope in the future. When we now 
look back on what Christ has done for us in God's revealed word in the Bible and look back what God has done for us. That gives us confidence in the present and therefore hope for the future. And the more you walk with God, your faith is going to grow and grow and grow because God will hear you over and over and over and over again. Now you have more reason to look back and say, because God has done, now he will do. Now your faith grows, now your confidence grows, and now your hope grows. And look at how God changes things around. In verse number 10, at the beginning of the psalm, David says, My bones are dismayed. My soul is greatly dismayed. God has a sense of humor. Look what God does. David now says, My enemies will be ashamed and greatly dismayed. God changed everything around and took everything that David was experiencing and now put it on his enemies. And in the same way that David suddenly had a turnaround in between verses 7 and 8 was David say, they, my adversaries, will suddenly be ashamed. Although it tarries, wait for it. Because when you cry out to God, God will hear you and he will act. And then suddenly, just when you think all hope is lost, he will extend his hand and he will act and smite your adversaries contrary to to all expectations. What Psalm number six reveals to us is that the cure for spiritual depression wasn't biological, it was spiritual. And at its core, there's only one thing that David did to cure his spiritual depression, and it was prayer. The real turning point of Psalm number 6 didn't happen in between verses 7 and 8. The real turning point of the psalm happened right before verse number 1, where David decided to go to God, to go to Yahweh, and then to enter into his presence with prayer. And that is what now began the chain reaction, which started in verse number 1 and then ended in verse Number 10. This is what John Calvin says about Psalm number 6. Quote, The confidence and security which David takes to himself from the favor of God ought to be noticed. From this we are taught that there is nothing in the whole world, whatever it may be, and whatever opposition it may make to us, which we may not despise if we are fully persuaded of our being loved by God. And by this also we understand what God's fatherly love can do for us. End quote. And what God's fatherly love can do for all of his children is everything. I'll close by saying this. Psalm number 6 has its ultimate meaning in Jesus Christ. David was a special type of Old Testament saint. He had a special relationship with God. He was God's thrice anointed king. But we don't need to have a special relationship with God now that we're in the time after the cross. Because guess what? David had to appeal to God based on David, based on a special relationship. But now when you profess faith in Jesus Christ and you cry out to God, you're not vouching for yourself. Jesus is vouching for you. So now God the Father sees the Son whom he beloves, who now makes supplications and advocates for us. So if, if, if anything else, we now should have more confidence more boldness than David did when he existed before the cross in the Old Testament. Psalm number 6 has ultimate meaning in Christ because Psalm number 6 preaches the gospel to us. In Psalm number 6, David was helpless and hopeless. He couldn't save himself. He came to God because he realized he couldn't redeem himself. And when he called upon God, God answered him. God is the one who acted to deliver 
David. I'm not going to mince words. If you don't know Christ, there's only one ultimate conclusion, destruction. If you don't know Christ, there's only one ultimate conclusion without the Messiah. The end is death. The end is depression. The end is hopelessness. But once you call on Jesus, death and depression never have the last word because he's the one who delivers you and gives you a resilient source of hope. We can't help ourselves, which is why God, through Jesus Christ, does the heavy lifting for us. Psalm number six has the ultimate meaning in Christ because David in Psalm number six had soul trouble. And this is what Jesus says in John 12, 27. Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. And what is this purpose? And that is simple. Jesus Christ came for the purpose to save sinners. And just like David called on God in Psalm number 6 to help him, call upon Jesus and he will deliver you. It would be unbiblical to see meaning for faith only in the good times. The Yahweh of the Bible works through wrath as well as grace, through depression as well as joy, through the dark night of the soul as well as as through the glorious light of the dawn. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the words that you have revealed to us today. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, that for all those individuals who received your word in Psalm number six, for many who are navigating the dark night of the soul, for many who feel burdened, for many who feel depressed, who many who may feel as if you are not there or felt separation from you. I pray, O Lord, that David's words in Psalm number six six, speak to them, that it touches their souls, and it gives them, O Lord, a sense of hope. It gives them, O Lord, a sense of light, that they may call upon you, they may approach you through the boldness and confidence of Jesus Christ, and you will hear them, O Lord, and you will there and act and give them the boldness, the reassurance, and the confidence they need to know that you have permissively allowed this episode for a reason, with good intent, and with good purpose. For you, Yahweh, are the God of hesed, of unyielding, loyal love. And this is why we delight in you, and this is why we cherish your words, which are purer than silver and more refined than precious gold. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.